and then you can chop it all up. Exactly. So that'd be absolutely fine. Cool. Um, so I take it that uh, that everyone can hear me. Um, I'm sure if you mentioned on the chat beforehand, if not so. Um, admittedly, this is my first webinar, so I might speak a little bit fast until all the coffee I've drank today finally wears off. Uh, and if you don't understand me, don't worry. I can send across a lengthy transcript afterwards, including including all the ums and ahs. Um, there's one. And the, the uh, talk itself will be available on YouTube afterwards uh, once I've worked out how, how to upload it. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you all to our first ever Explore Functional Programming Meetup. Um, when we finally do achieve world domination, you can all say you were here and did absolutely nothing to stop it. Before I hand across to our two speakers today, I'd just like to introduce myself to those of you who haven't had the pleasure of speaking with me before. My name is Pete, and I've been part of the functional community for the past five or so years. During that time, I've helped lots of engineers get their first and then subsequent steps on the functional programming ladder, helped companies go through huge tra transformation projects from object-oriented programming, and companies scale from small sort of bedroom offices right up to tower blocks. Um, so I've seen a lot, uh, and I've certainly seen the... The functional world grow over the last of the last five years, and uh, it seems to be a trend that uh, isn't going away. Um, I achieved a lot of this whilst working for a well-known functional programming job board, uh, but now I've taken on a new challenge, an Explore Group, where I'm really planning to become part of this community and give back to an industry that, first of all, really interests me, uh, and second of all, the community has always been so welcoming. Um, the reason I started this meetup group in particular was to provide a, set, uh, a setting where all levels of functional programmer can network and share ideas. I think too often it's really tough to find the right advice when it comes to pro progressing your career in software engineering. So hopefully this can provide a safe place to have those discussions uh, and we can all gain something from today uh, and hopefully monthly in, in future um, and potentially in-person meetups next year if uh, if the world's pandemic calm down, calms down a little bit. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a first a few polls. Um, the first interview is a poll before this meetup to get an idea of the audience so we can tailor these talks for future future meetups. The next one is some questions from today's speakers. Uh, they've taken some, some time out of their schedules to, to make PowerPoints uh, and such. So if you could answer them, that'd be great. Uh, the on-site on interview section is, is if you're interested in giving a talk at the next meetup. Uh, and the final one is for feedback after the talks. Um, after the meetup, there's also a survey which you can use to, to book a call with me to go through any of the above, really. Um, you'll also see an option for Q&A. Uh, just a little reminder to keep all of this polite and that anything but friendliness will not be tolerated. Uh, that even counts if Ben starts claiming that press-ups are essential during daily sprints. <laughs> Finally, finally from me, uh, as I mentioned, I'll be sharing this event live on YouTube. So if you have to duck out, it'll be available afterwards. Um, I'll also be sharing some updates and snippets from the talk uh, via my social accounts. So I really appreciate if you guys can can like and share those. I'm not a streamer, so I don't get paid per views. However, it really does help me uh, reach out to the wider market of functional engineers. Uh, our first speaker today is coming to us all the way from Canada, which is a real litmus test of the webinar software by Zoom. Uh, his name's Francis, and he currently runs his own business called Contramap, which is a consulting company providing technical exp expertise regarding so functional programming. And he'll be giving you a talk on functional design. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you across to him. Um, here you go, Francis. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, okay, so just let me share my screen. As uh, so you have to... Uh, uh, okay, perfect. Okay, got it. Uh, I guess you can see that. That correct. All right. So I think we should be all good. All right. So yeah, my name is Francis. As Pete said, uh, I'm um, I'm a software developer, and uh, I live in Canada, uh, more precisely in Quebec, uh, not too far from Montreal. So uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, software design uh, in general and more, like more precisely about best practices. And we'll see how does that relate to functional design. So software, software design actually is hard, uh, but doesn't, 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 need to, doesn't need to be. Um, uh, so basically, like, sorry, as like 15 years ago, uh, 
my mentor, like, um, uh, sorry, I have a problem with my, you know, so can you see the title right now? Yeah, okay, good, thank you. So 15 years ago, my mentor made me realize how much maintainable and sustainable design matters. And uh, not only for economic reasons, but also for the sake of my own mental health. So um, as a young, young and junior developer, I decided to study uh, this craft and pretty much read everything that I could get my hands on. Uh, so authors such as Robert Martin, Sandy Metz, uh, Andrew Hunt, or Ken Beck uh, became among my favorite at that time. Uh, however, several years later, I realized that um, uh, despite all the studying, um, I was still unable to, to, uh, to, to figure out how, how to write code such as the one, uh, just the one that it was described by, by my initial mentor. Um, in fact, I, I ended up too often like taking way too many shortcuts um, or simply blindly applying um, all, those, all those principles without really understanding what they stand for. And the, the problem is that um, one cannot get these guidelines right uh, as long as, um, um, as long as their um, like fundamentals are not properly understood. And, and basically this is, this is something we, we tend, uh, to, we tend to, uh, to forget whenever we, we teach design. Uh, like instead we, we overrun people with thousands and thousands of principles without actually uh, conveying what ties them all together. So um, if, you, if you think about it, like all those practices uh, and, and, uh, and paradigms and, 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 uh, and, and basically guidelines and all, they all share some common ideas, which all together form the set of some fundamental uh, guidelines that are required to, to write sustainable software. So in the next slide, we'll attempt to, to, uh, to sum up these ideas and we'll come up with three main principles, uh, which I think are really critical when it comes to, to, uh, to software design in general. All right, so let's see some code. So the code, the examples I'm gonna provide you with uh, today are all in Scala. Uh, I've made sure that I'm not using any uh, funky annotation or syntax, but in any case, if there's something you don't understand, please interrupt me. Um, I left some time precisely for that. So in by one uh, is a function that uh, takes an integer and uh, returns another one. And uh, according to its signature, um, it seems to basically, it's, it seems to be responsible for incrementing uh, by one the integer is provided with. Uh, now, if you think about it, int by one could be implemented in different ways. We could use uh, bitwise operators, for example, or we could use simply the, 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 plus, the, the plus operator. Is that really a concern? Do we really care about that? Uh, not really. Uh, all we care about really is uh, that in by one does what it claims to do. That is incrementing by one the integer, the integer it's provided with. Now, in which situation would we, would we really care about this? Uh, well, we would care if given a specific argument, um, in by one starts doing something that is not uh, captured by its signature. So for example, um, outputting a string given a three. So what is, what, is the, what is the implication of, of such behavior? Well, uh, first of all, we wouldn't be able anymore to precisely say what, uh, what ink by one is, how ink by one is behaving at your time without actually looking at its internal. So uh, the direct consequence is that we lose refactoring capabilities. Um, so for example, in this case, I would not be able to replace X by a tuple of eight and 11 simply because I don't necessarily know what's going to happen. Maybe an out, a string is going to be output on the console. Maybe an exception is going to be thrown, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So basically, there is absolutely no guarantee provided by by one as is uh, that that tells you uh, telling you that everything is going to be fine when you do this. And more moreover, there is no guarantee that uh, one, that, that the program will behave the same way and output the same thing once uh, the the refactoring has been done. So basically. In other words, you cannot, um, like we cannot rely on environment signature to forecast its behavior at runtime. 
So let's look at uh, another example. Uh, so here we have a function foo, which, um, which has one input, uh, the integer, uh, like the like name number, and one output, which is the Boolean returned by the function. The, the implementation is quite straightforward. I mean, it, it's just responsible for checking if a number is equal to 42 or not. Uh, so next, I, I'd like to, to look at this exercise. Uh, so basically, we, we apply foo uh, to, to 42 and assign the result to x. And so the question is about figuring out if uh, proc1 is equivalent to proc2. So as a matter of fact, they're equivalent, simply because if you replace the content of proc2 by proc1, you will actually uh, not uh, modify the, the programs in any way, the program in any way. I mean, you will get the same output, same behavior. You won't have any, any, any problem, any, any change in the, in the program's behavior. So let's do the same exercise with another function, bar this, this time, which has pretty much the same signature than foo, except that if you look at uh, bar's implementation, you'll notice that there's a, a console that is printed out, uh, sorry, a string that is printed out on the console whenever you, you call bar. So basically, um, bar has one input, which is the integer provided to the function, one output, which is the Boolean uh, returned by the function, plus an additional output, which is the string uh, being printed out on the console. So, so if you think about it, bar has one input and two, it, two, in, two, two outputs, among, among which one is actually hidden from the reader. Uh, you, you don't have any mention of this output in the, in the signature. So if you do we, the, the same exercise, so we apply uh, bar 42, assign the result to y, and then wonder if proc3 is equivalent to proc4. Well, we'll conclude that these are actually not equivalent at all. Uh, if you try to, to replace the content of proc4 by proc3, you will end up basically outputting uh, the checking number string three times instead of only one. So uh, just like in by one, uh, we cannot um, rely on bar signature in order to forecast its behavior at runtime. And moreover, uh, you cannot replace uh, a call to bar by the value it produces or vice versa. In contrast with bar and ink by one, functions such as foo have a very interesting property that can be reasoned about locally. So local reasoning enables a reader to make sense of a function without looking at how it's implemented. So in other words, a function can be locally reasoned about uh, whenever its inputs and outputs are all captured respectively by its argument list and its return time. So uh, I have a little story about this. Um, in the past, I used to work on a on an open source project, one of the biggest actually of its kind. Uh, it's related to telecommunication. And uh, the code has a pretty high level of uh, technical depth. And so I ended up with this function, uh, which basically had, had an implementation, which was, I don't know, one, like 100 or 200 lines. I mean, something crazy. And it was doing all kinds of stuff, like throwing exception, returning nulls and all. And on top of that, it was also calling other functions, which were doing the exact same thing. Basically, they were not mentioned. They were not locally reasoned about. So I didn't know exactly what the function was, uh, was, was supposed to do once, once it's running, uh, when the application is deployed. And I was really, uh, I, I felt really uncomfortable actually calling it. And so I got told that uh, it's my responsibility to figure out all the possible outputs for that function. But if you think about it, I mean, if you get to a you can get to a certain point where it's actually impossible to do. I mean, you have it, it can get pretty pretty exponential at, at at some level. So basically, one of the advantage of local reasoning, uh, like basically uh, one of the advantage of being transparent regarding what a function does um, through its signature is that it prevents uh, mental juggling. So you don't need to think about global states. You don't need to think about uh, potential exceptions that are not. Uh, mentioned in the signature or null pointer, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, a, that's, that's extremely, um, I would say, um, it gives you some, some peace of mind actually when you, when you call the function. So yeah, local reasoning prevents mental juggling, but it also provides you better guarantees once again, because 
the inputs and the outputs of the function are all captured by the signature. So you have more guarantees about what's going to happen uh, at runtime. Of course, you can still have extreme situations. So for example, if somebody plugs out the server, well, you're done, obviously. But uh, as far as the software is concerned, local reasonable functions would provide a better guarantees from that point of view. A function that can be uh, locally reasoned about is also one which can be uh, abstracted over uh, to build more complex software. So a good analogy for that, in my opinion, is language, human language, I mean, not programming ones. Uh, so for example, you don't need to explain how a car works every time you want to talk about it, right? The word car conveys, conveys enough meaning so that, so, that, so that you can reuse it in a sentence and even combine it with, with other words to, uh, to, to express more complex, uh, com complex concepts, such as a sport car, for example, or, or a utility car, et cetera, et cetera. So local, local reasoning is really the, the fundamental principle of abstraction. And this, this concept is absolutely critical when it comes to build more complex software. And by complex software, I'm not saying uh, like very complex software with hundreds and hundreds of lines of code, but even if just like thousands of, of lines of code, I mean, that's already complex. That's already too much we can bear in mind. So uh, local reasoning is also very close to another concept, which is called referential transparency. If you have been in functional programming for a while, uh, you've probably uh, heard about it. So referential transparency and local reasoning pretty much uh, relate to the, to the same kind of idea. There are some subtleties, but, but overall, that's, that's, that's the same, same thing. OK, so uh, let's get back to the real world now. If you think about this, um, local reasoning, uh, in order to use it, in order to make a function locally reasonable, uh, it's going to re require you to, to get rid of exceptions, uh, nulls, uh, side effects, and even statements like print and end, read line, etc. So, so that's a lot. And the problem is that no matter how a program is designed, at some point, you will have to perform some effect to, to read uh, data from the console, uh, to call an HTTP service, to store some data in the file system, to read data for, I don't know, from, from database, whatever. So the whole question is how we can, uh, how can we reconcile local reasoning uh, with, uh, with, uh, with statements in general? So I realized uh, by saying that, that I haven't defined what, a side, what is a side effect. Um, so basically a side effect is generated whenever you, uh, a function uh, requires an input that is not captured uh, in, the, in the function's arguments list. And whenever you generate an output, which is not captured by its result type. So that's, that's pretty much uh, the, the brief uh, definition for a side effect. And every time you use a statement, actually you are creating a side effect. Um, am I going too fast? Is there any questions so far? All good? All right. Yeah. So effects are always required no matter how, how you do it. Okay, so, so let's take an example and see um, how, how, can, how can we do better, how we can do better. So a program is a function that, according to its signature, doesn't require any input and uh, which doesn't uh, output anything. So if you think about it for a second, a, like a function that doesn't take anything, that doesn't require anything, and that doesn't output anything, is pretty much meaningless. It, it's useless. I mean, there's no reason to call it. But if you if you look at its implementation, you'll notice that there's an input provided by that read line statement, and another uh, and, and an output which is provided by this println uh, statement that basically uh, outputs the whatever is returned by the the read line statement. So. Um, the problem is that these inputs and outputs are nowhere mentioned. And therefore, uh, whenever uh, you see this kind of function, you can be 100% sure that what we are dealing with is, is a function with side effects. So program can be reasoned about locally, does not guarantee anything, um, and is therefore very like, pretty and safe to run, even though the function is pretty simple in this case. So let, let's see how we can do better. So if you think about it, um, uh, a statement is, is um, eager is non-deterministic and uh, cannot be replaced by the value it produces. Uh, this, is goes, this goes actually in contrast with values which are uh, lazy, 
deterministic and interchangeable. So, so the trick here is to, to think about how we can bring statements back to the world of values. So in order to do so, um, we can create a wrapper, which basically is responsible for wrapping uh, a function that, uh, that potentially has a side effect. So in this case, I, I've called it unsafe run. Uh, so Agile can be really think about, uh, thought about, sorry, uh, like uh, a lazy uh, value of type A, all right? Um, using this, uh, this, uh, this wrapper, we can now, now define like, uh, any, like different instructions that are representing uh, our statement. So put string line will actually be responsible for representing uh, the effect consisting of um, outputting a string on a console, while get string line will be responsible for getting some input from the from the user in the console. And using these two uh, to to, uh, to uh, representation of our statements, we can uh, basically create the same program that that we had before. But however, we still need some way to sequence instructions. We don't have that yet. So basically, we need the equivalent of the semicolon in Java. So for that, uh, we we add the and then operator, which basically call uh, a function which is called change. So I, I named these differently just so we can see the we can we can distinguish distinguish them in the in the slide. But basically, the chain operator is only responsible for piping the result of an I/O uh, to a function which itself will create another I/O. And so that basically allows you to sequence instructions that are um, on which one may be depending on, on the, the result of the other one. Um, now, once you, you get to that point, um, actually what you have is just a data structure describing what you want to do, but it doesn't, doesn't perform anything. What we need actually here is to call uh, a function, in this case, and say friend, to perform any side effects that are required to produce the value of type A. So what, what have we done here? Uh, well, we made a clear distinction between um, the description of a program and its execution. The declaration is locally reasonable, uh, while its execution is not. And as we saw, saw it earlier, local reasoning gives you some superpower, which are lost as soon as uh, side effects are being executed. So this tells us something about um, where side effects and more generally um, the execution of a program should be done. And these guys should be actually done at the edges of a program. What do we mean by edges? Well, uh, in a program, there are usually um, two distinct parts. Um, you have uh, the business logic, which is, uh, or the core, which is uh, prone to change a lot. And the infrastructure, which are responsible for using it. So the, the, the core doesn't depend on anything. The infrastructure depends on the core. And by the way, if you're interested by this kind of architecture, it's, it's called the hexagonal architecture or ports and adapt. There are different names, but that's always the same principle. So the core is prone to change a lot. The infrastructure are pretty static. By infrastructure, we usually mean um, anything that uh, relates to, uh, like anything like an SQL layer, an HTTP layer, file system layer, tests, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that, uh, that is actually using the, the, the business logic. So for these reasons, uh, the business logic should be always easy to reason about uh, while being agnostic of, of how it is used. In other words, um, you want to make sure that anything that is uh, executed, that is, that is generating side effect, is actually put outside uh, the, the business logic. And as beyond the execution point, there is nothing that can be assumed about a function We'd rather delay the moment when a side effect have to be have to be uh, have to be run. Once this moment has been reached, uh, we got to what is referred to as the the edges of the application. So beyond that point, uh, you lose any any kind of superpowers that local reasoning gives you. So how do we reconcile uh, the execution and the declaration uh, of a program? Well, simply uh, sorry. How do we reconcile uh, side effects? with uh, local reasoning, but well, simply by separating uh, those two concerns, which are declaration and execution. Um, yeah. All right, so having said that now, uh, let's look back um, at our implementation of IO. So uh, IO 
enables us to bring back statements to, uh, to the world of values, all right? But there's a limitation. If you think about it, about it, an IO is nothing more than just a data structure wrapping a function which potentially have side effects. And because functions cannot be compared without being executed, uh, we cannot know if two IO states, uh, if two IOs, IO values, sorry, are equivalent or not. You cannot do that without actually performing the side effects uh, that they describe, and um, basically to, to produce the, 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 the different values you, you need to compare. So from a testing perspective, it's pretty bad uh, because it prevents us uh, from, from comparing things, like from comparing IOs without executing, uh, unless you execute the side effects. And secondly, we cannot know if an IO is the result of a composition of multiple IOs or not. So um, at the end, when you look at P P1 and P2, the only thing uh, that uh, the, the only guarantee you get is basically the type of value that's going to be produced if the IO is successfully run. But you have no idea about uh, what is what has happened under the hood. So P1 and P2 can be can may be equivalent uh, once once the side effects have been have been uh, executed, or they may not or, or not basically. So there there's no point to there's no way to to know that. So uh, IO is, is a pretty good first step uh, to, to achieve local reasoning, but it's clearly not enough. I mean, that's just a way that's, it, it, it sounds a little bit like cheating when you think about it. So let's try another approach. Um, in this case, uh, we're gonna try to, to represent instructions, not in terms of functions, but in terms of data structure. So to do that, uh, we're gonna create a trait uh, for those who are not familiar with, uh, with the concept of a trait, that's basically an interface uh, which allows implementations. I think that's, that's supported by Java now. It's been a while since I've done any Java, to be honest. But anyway, basically you create that trait, which is, uh, which is IO. And then we're gonna use that trait to actually uh, create new data structure. So each data structure is gonna represent one statement uh, that are required to express our program. So get string, string line will represent uh, an IO which results in a string, put string line will take a string and result in an IO that, um, that, that produces a, like a unit value, pretty much a void basically. And uh, along with this, with this, with, the, with this data structure, we're gonna provide um, what we call constructors. So basically functions uh, that are only responsible to, to, uh, to instantiate um, like uh, the data structure we just mentioned. Just like before, we all also need a way to sequence instruction. And to do so, uh, we introduce that chain data, stru data structure. And the chain data structure is just responsible for storing uh, the IO we want to sequence with, along with the function required to create the, the, the next IO. So if you compared this approach to the one before, um, so everything is, is expressed in terms of data structure instead of, uh, of functions, even the operator. Okay, so um, what do we get with this? Well, first of all, we can uh, write the same kind of program than before. However, one thing that is really, really interesting is that what you end up with is actually just a data structure. And this data structure can be inspected, traversed, and even optimized if needed, all right? Uh, what do I mean by optimize? Well, because you can traverse that data stru structure just like a list, you can decide, for example, to fuse uh, some instruction instruction that belong together. You can decide to skip some instruction if you want, like for example, uh, any anything that is related to logging, let's say, and so on. So um, it's just a data structure, and because it's a data structure, you can also use it in testing to compare it with something that you expect. Because once again, because you can traverse the data structure like a list, like there's no problem uh, to, to, um, to, to compare uh, two IOs now. Now, um, we have this data structure and just like before the data structure doesn't provide you uh, with any, like you don't perform anything by just declaring it. Um, in order to, to, to produce the, the, the value that is described by the IO, you will need a separate function, which sole uh, purpose is actually to run all the side effects that are described by the, by the data structure uh, in order to, to, to produce the value. So uh, how does that work? So basically the run uh, function takes uh, the program in an in argument uh, and then it will basically inspect it 
to figure out what has to be done in order to, uh, to produce a value. And it will do that in a recursive fashion. So uh, in Scala, we have this concept of pattern matching. I know it's, it exists, I think, at Kotlin and some other modern languages. But basically, we look at the, we look at the program. If it's, for example, a git string line or a put, str put string line, then we will uh, execute all, any side effect that is, um, any corresponding side effect that is required to, uh, to produce the value we're looking for. And if we have a more a sophisticated program resulting from a combination of those two instructions, we will end up with a chain. Um, so notice that, uh, however, the implementation I've provided here is not a stack safe. So basically we'll get stack overflow if you, if you uh, do stuff like infinite, uh, infinite programs that can be solved using a technique called trampolining, but I won't cover that right now. Maybe if I have some time, I can show you some, uh, some uh, code that actually, actually exploit that. In any case, um, using this approach, we, we managed to, um, to basically uh, keep that separation between the description of the program, that is the what, and it takes its execution detail, uh, details, that is the how, uh, while also providing uh, inspection uh, optimization capabilities to the API. A good way to think about this approach is actually to think in terms of programming language, where the language provides you uh, any, like the building blocks to, uh, to describe what you want to do, well, the compiler and uh, is actually responsible for interpreting that um, that that description into something that can be executed by the computer. All right. So, despite uh, being different, these two approaches approaches have actually uh, many similarities. So, first of all, uh, both actually are making that clean separation between the what and the how. In one case, however, we embed the solution into the data structure, uh, that is on line one, while in the other, we keep that uh, evaluation function set as, like, apart from the data structure. Secondly, uh, solutions and uh, primitives are, uh, are basically used in, in both approaches. So in one case, uh, we have basically primitives and constructors that are uh, described using the same uh, building block, uh, that is uh, line four and five. While in the other approach, we make a clean uh, distinction between primitives, which are described as data structures, and constructors, which are function responsible for instantiating those data structures. And finally, we have operators. Um, in one case, we have an operator described as a, as a function, as a, described using actually the evaluation function. While in the other case, uh, once again, we rely on the data structure. So as you can see in one approach, in the first approach, we, we express everything in terms of functions, while in the second approach, we express everything in terms of data structure. So uh, in fact, those uh, two encodings refer each other like to, like respect, respectively to uh, uh, executable encoding and declarative encoding. So in the executa sorry, executable encoding, um, so the executable encoding is usually uh, simpler for newcomers. It's also e easier to implement in, the, in a legacy code base. And as all constructors and operators are, are expressed in terms uh, of, uh, of the evaluation function, adding new constructors and operators is pretty simple. So if you think about the first approach, like adding a new operator or a, or a new uh, primitive is, is pretty, pretty all right. All, all, all it requires basically is just to create a new I and to specify the function it's going to run. However, adding new evaluation function is pretty hard uh, as it requires you to modify every existing constructors and primitive and operator. So think about the first approach once again. If I had to basically add another kind of unsafe run, I would have to do so in every terms described by, uh, by the API. Now in contrast, the declarative encoding uh, basically mirrors uh, the executable encoding uh, in terms of pros and cons. So it's very flexible uh, if you need to, to add new evaluation function, once again, because the evaluation function is, is defined apart from uh, the data structure, from the primitives and the constructors. However, it's gonna struggle uh, whenever you need to, uh, to add new primitives and operators, simply because you will have to, to change every evaluation function that are already defined. So as you can see, they are really uh, mirroring each other. So two encoding are really the opposite of each other's. 
And if you have been in this industry for, for, for some time, you may recognize the expression problem here. Um, which is really well is illustrated by uh, the differences between object-oriented programming and functional programming. Now, uh, despite all those differences, uh, both encoding are built upon similar uh, building, uh, like similar similar blocks. Uh, so that they both model the domain in terms of primitives, operators, and constructor constructors. And if you have been in this industry for a while, uh, you may recognize a pattern here which is common to every composable APIs uh, like Joda time, um, collection APIs in general, rules engines, and even uh, functions API. So if you, if, you have, if you have dealt with languages which see um, functions as a first citizen, you'll see that uh, you, can, you have the functions being like, the functions are actually primitives and you have operators that allow, allow you to, to combine these functions to create new ones or to transform them. So, so that's, uh, that's basically what, what composition is really all about. Um, composition, along with uh, local reasoning and purity, is the third most important principle an API should have. And if you think about it, uh, building a software consists always of creating simple blocks to, com and to combine them into uh, uh, bigger blocks using operators. This is really the, the essence of composition. However, uh, this cannot be achieved if you cannot abstract over these blocks. And this is why local reasoning and purity are so critical. Uh, if you cannot reason about a block and then try to build over it, then you have no idea about what's gonna, what's, what's, what, what you're gonna end up with really. Uh, you have no guarantees about what's gonna happen in runtime. time. And this is why all the, like, the three principles are really, really important. Um, so composition is based on these fundament, so fundamentals and is what lets you let an API uh, to be decomposed and recomposed to introduce new business requirement uh, to um, or to modify existing ones. All right, so some pro tips regarding um, how you can tackle composition in general. Um, so when it comes to primitive, make sure they are composable. So that, that sounds really obvious, but you have to, to, to build them so that uh, you can combine small blocks to compose um, uh, bigger blocks. Secondly, they have to be orthogonal. Uh, so in order to prevent overlap in terms of capabilities. Um, so that's basically the single responsibility principle applied uh, to, uh, to primitives. And finally, they have to be, to, to, to have to be, they have to be minimal in terms of number. So basically whenever you design primitives, make sure that you cover the full spectrum of um, the, the solutions that are needed to answer a specific problem uh, provided by a, by a domain. And I try to, to, uh, to keep this number low. Um, so it's gonna give you like, basically the, the less primitives you have, the, the, the less is the risk, like the, the smaller is the risk to, uh, to, to get uh, primitives overlapping each other in terms of capabilities. When it comes to operators, uh, you basically have two kind of operators. Um, um, binary operators and un unary operators. So binary operators are here to um, are responsible for combining existing solution to existing solutions into into a new one. While unary operator are responsible for transforming an existing solution. In any case, these guys usually uh, return the same type than uh, their arguments type. Uh, there are some exceptions. Sometimes, um, sometimes you have to go through a different type, but at some point you will you will have to to get. To that, uh, to that primitive type. Uh, finally, look for some and product composition patterns uh, like zip width, uh, zip, uh, zip, either either width, uh, both and both widths. So I haven't talked about this uh, because it's it's a whole topic on its own. However, uh, I wrote an article in my blog about this um, with many examples. If you're interested, I'm actually thinking about doing another talk about this uh, at some point in the future. All right, so let's recap. So today we looked, uh, we've looked at three uh, properties, which I think, once again, that's my opinion. Uh, I'm not claiming that I have the right answer, but I think these are critical when it comes to software design. Uh, local reasoning gives you uh, the ability to reason about your code and to abstract over existing components. So, the, so that you don't need to know uh, their internals uh, to, to understand what they do. Purity will, uh, Allow you to will enable you to uh, to separate uh, the business logic uh, from how it is executed, and so it's therefore um, absolutely critical if you want to make your code locally. I mean, if you want to to make your 
business logic, reusable and local re reasonable. And finally, um, composition is the end goal of this approach. It guarantees a code base, always allow the introduction of new business requirements and or the modification of existing ones without having to rewrite everything from scratch. So uh, if you think about this now, in contrast with the vast amount of best practices and pattern available today, these are really easy to keep in mind. Um, they compose a small set of principles that can be really easy, that can be easily reasoned about and illustrated. Um, now, just like any other approach, uh, it requires experience and practice to really assimilate it. Uh, but overall, I really think we should put the emphasis on these, on these principles when teaching software, uh, software design and prevent overwhelming people with, uh, with other principles, which when you think about it are deriving of those three. So, all right, so that's, I, do I have, do I have some time? Like, okay. Um, so I'd like to show you something else. Um, uh, that's, let me, let me show you. Like some code. Um, all right. Uh, and meanwhile, I'm gonna also uh, look at the question. So, so sorry, it was uh, oh, maybe. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll answer the questions after. So here I have uh, re-implemented uh, the IO the IO trait. One of my friends, so I gave this talk yesterday uh, just as a rehearsal uh, to, to one of my friends, and he told me that um, the problem with the example I provided are, pro are, are usually the, are always the same. Basically, everybody uses these examples when, when we want to talk about local reasoning, referential transparency, and um, functional programming in general. So he, he suggested me to, to provide other examples that are more meaningful when it comes to, to this kind of approach. So what I did is I've added uh, like basically failure management, error management, and also uh, the possibility to retry a specific um, specific IO. So let's say you have an IO that may fail at some point, and you want to retry it multiple time uh, until you get uh, uh, until you, you you reach a certain uh, certain certain count. So uh, if you don't know Scala, there's probably a lot of uh, there's some gibberish here. Um, but basically, what I really want to show you is, um, is this. Uh, not trampoline, trampoline, that's different. So remember earlier, I, I showed you some, um, yeah, I showed you some, some examples of, a, of an interpreter. And basically, I showed you that, that um, um, uh, basically, I'm, 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 I'm executing side effects depending on, on the shape of the program I want to execute. Uh, so in the case of put string line, in, like I execute the println, uh, println uh, statement. In this case, I wrap the result of this println into an either. And basically when I'm saying that it's a right, uh, I'm saying that everything basically is going all right. Uh, same for get, get string line. Uh, for and then, uh, we had to use a flat map, which is provided by either. You don't even if you are not familiar with flat map and all this construct, um, it's it's actually fine. I mean, it's, uh, just think about sequencing and how you could uh, the, the same way you can sequence IO, you can seque sequence IO. So basically, I'm saying that if this guy is 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 going all right, if it's uh, returning me uh, a, a right value, then I can sequence it with something else. Uh, and in this case, we're basically just applying the function on that result, on the result of that previous computation, and um, uh, reapplying the, the run function. If we have a failed uh, we just return a left. And if we have a retry, what we do is basically we're going to return, um, we're going to recursively call, call run until we get, um, until we, we reach that count or until we get an error or, or, yeah, or, or, or until we get the, the right value, basically. So here's, there's a, there's a program describing that. Um, so we have get string line, we then sequence it. Uh, depending on the on the value we get, if it's for example admin, uh, like the string admin, we're gonna say okay, the problem uh, you can get in. If not, then well, uh, that doesn't work as you want, and basically we're gonna say it's a failure, and we're gonna fail with that following string, and we're gonna retry that um, three times. And after three times, if the, uh, the the password has not been provided, then uh, we just consider it as a failure, and we're gonna fail with this uh, with this. Uh, with this, uh, with this error. All right, so, um, okay. 
maybe I can show you this uh, actually running. Um, actually, before doing that, so that's that's one version of the interpreter. And as I mentioned, it's not stack safe. And the, the, basically, the reason why it's not stack safe is it's because we cannot, um, like whenever you do recursive, uh, recursive uh, calls of the same function, you have to make sure uh, basically that uh, to be tail recursive. So that's that's another topic. But basically, if you try to run this function on a, on a, on a infinite with, with infinite programs, you will end up with a stack overflow. And this can be actually be fixed with trampolining that I did here, what I, that I've implemented here. Um, I'm going to provide uh, this code um, later along with the slides, so you can you can look at this and you can ask me questions about it later on if you want. All right. So what I'd like to show you is um, how does that work concretely, and then then I'll be done. Um, uh, is that the right one? Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, so let me just, uh, yeah, right. Okay, so if I type the console, all right, I just have to do one, oops. Uh, I have to do an import. Okay, I think it's somewhere over here. Okay, here we go. And then, uh, so run is my initial function. So if I do this, um, yeah, obviously. Okay, let me try this. Okay, so here we go. So if I put, for example, test, it won't work. Uh, if I do that three times, I will end up with an error uh, telling me that basically I don't have soup tonight. Uh, if I, however, uh, uh, did, um, I can put the right password, then no problem. Now, the second thing I wanna show you is this. So count is another program, which basically will um, run five times and print out the, the, the string test every time it it, uh, it runs, and uh, once once the count has been reached, it's gonna it's gonna um, it's gonna finish. So run the run actually is my is my um, is my evaluation function. So if I, if I do this five times, then no problem. However, if I go a little bit, let's say so let's say if I do this, I will get uh, a stack overflow exception, telling me that now you cannot do that because your stack is basically overflowing, I mean, your recursive calls are not properly done. If I do that, however, with this other function, uh, which is run zero, which is using trampolining, then you can go as far as you want. Um, um, and you can go basically forever without any issue. All right, so uh, let's conclude. Okay, so uh, a couple of references. Um, so I haven't, come with all those ideas uh, on my own, obviously. Uh, I've learned that uh, um, like while reading books and all, but recently I've uh, I, I subscribed to uh, what is called the Spartan program, which is led by John DeGos. And um, this gives you access to uh, all the courses that he, that he delivers. Uh, one of them is actually called functional design uh, or the art of functional, uh, functional design, I think. And he goes very deep in all those composition aspects. Um, so the approach I, I, I presented you tonight is actually uh, coming uh, from his course. Then there's an article uh, by Adam Rosen, I think that's, uh, I hope I'm not mispronouncing his name, uh, which is called What is an Effect, which, go, which talks about local reasoning in general. And then there's an article by John DeGos, a beginner-friendly tour, tour through functional programming at Scala that I highly suggest you to, to look at if you've never heard about all the things that I've covered tonight. Uh, a bunch of workshops. Um, there's going to be a workshop about functional data modeling uh, in mid-November, also led by John DeGos. Uh, same, uh, I think the art of functional design is currently ongoing. However, it should be like uh, delivered again in the future. And there's another really interesting workshop called uh, Domain Modeling Made Functional Online Workshop, which is which uses F sharp. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm probably going to mispronounce his name. He's called he's called uh, Scott. Bashley, I guess, but um, please, I'm really sorry. I don't know how, how his name should be pronounced. Uh, but anyway, I've put the link if you're interested there in the slides I'm gonna provide you with. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Francis Todd. I'm, I'm an independent uh, software developer specialized in functional programming and in, um, in Scala in general. 
Uh, my company is called Contramap. My blog, you can find me, find my articles on contramap.dev along with uh, the slides and some code and all. And I provide coding, uh, training, and, and software design in general. Thank you very much. Is there any question? Oh, okay. So now I can look at the question. Uh, okay. So, okay. How do you code so you never get an exception? Well, uh, usually um, instead of actually, so we, usually when I design um, my primitives, I make sure to, to represent illegal, illegal states. So uh, if you remember, like earlier, I, I showed you some code that basically may fail for different reasons. For example, you, you try to execute an IO multiple times. Let's say it's an HTTP call, uh, the server is down. So you get an error every time you, you do that call. Uh, whenever I, had, I have the situation, I actually return, instead of uh, throwing an exception, I'm going to return a value representing the error I'm, I'm, I want to, to model. So it could be a failure, it could be a, a left value, it could be anything, but you don't need exception actually. All you need is just to return um, a meaningful, like a value that is meaningful enough to tell the, the caller that um, you may have a problem with the, with the you, 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 you basically encountered a problem while, while executing the function. Um, does, that, does that answer your question, Angus? Okay, okay, good. So uh, another in the Q&A, what's your approach to structuring the code base of a functional project? Um, I, guess, I guess I've, I've covered it, this a little bit. So uh, first of all, the, the main, uh, I think the main, the, the most important thing is basically to keep that business logic as pure as possible. And actually I would even say like, keep it pure, like uh, no side effects at all. Um, side effects should be executed by the infrastructures. And so, um, whenever I um, I have to, to deal with except with uh, sorry with side effects, I basically use that ports and app approach or the hexagonal uh, architecture approach. So um, I provide some kind of an interface uh, that has to be implemented by the infrastructure, which will provide all the the, the, the machinery to execute the side effect. But the interface itself is provided by the business logic. So in terms of dependency, the infrastructure is depending on the, on the business logic and not the other way around. Um, and so this interface is also design, designed such that uh, all the functions that I'm calling are returning um, value, values that are referential uh, transparent, uh, such as IO, such as anything else, actually. Um, to, to, to add on top of this, um, so in this case, I came up with uh, with this toy uh, IO, but actually you have a whole like you have other libraries that are doing that on a more professional scale, I would say. So Zio, for example, uh, as you can guess, I'm a big fan of what John does. does. So uh, I suggest you to look at it. You can look also at Cats; uh, it does something similar, not exactly the same approach, um, but these are two ways to to look at the same thing. Uh, is that all right for you, James? Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh, is there any other question? All right. Okay. In any case, uh, you can join me. I'm pretty easy, easy to find. Uh, just type my name or contramap.dev. Uh, um, like I, I try to, I try to be quite responsive. So <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. I'll give you back the, 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 the host. Uh, Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much for that, Francis. Um, it's, it's different for me uh, listening to something like that because it, a lot of it goes right over the top of my head. Um, but hopefully it's provided some value to, uh, to everyone else that's here. Um, just a quick question for everyone on the chat. Can you now see the polls now I'm hosting again? No. Ah. I'm going to have an angry call with, uh, with Zoom tomorrow. <laughs> so see what's going on there. They're supposed to be along the bottom uh, bottom bar next to Q&A, between Q&A and chat. I can see them, which is the least helpful thing that uh, could possibly happen. <laughs> anyway, um, so like I said, once again, thank you. Thank you very much to Francis. Um, 
if you'd like any further information on the subject, um, feel free to let me know uh, and I can try and put you in touch with Francis or um, I'll just say, share with you the links to, to his blogs and his website, um, which I'm sure has got a lot of interesting stuff on. Um, whilst I've got your attention, I wouldn't really be doing my job if I didn't mention that I'm currently hiring for a number of functional positions uh, and that if you are interested in a confidential conversation, you can drop me a message on any of my social channels uh, and I'll happy, be happy to share with you any insight I can into the market. Um, like I mentioned, there's a little survey at the end where you can put in your details, uh, like when's best to reach you, basically. Uh, and I'll, I'll endeavour to get in, get in contact as soon as I can. Um, also, a quick note to any hiring managers, potentially in the audience, uh, I'd love to chat with you too uh, about how we can sort of better recruit software engineers. Even if you're not ready to use me or Explore yet, uh, I'd still appreciate the time to have a chat about how you're currently finding hiring. Even if it's going terrifically well, uh, I'd love to. I'd love to find out why. Um, if you're in neither of those categories, it's fine too. Um, if you're if you're desperately looking for a job that's away from functional programming, or desperately looking for engineers that potentially don't do functional programming yet, um, let me know. The benefit of joining a, a bit of a larger business is that we have a huge amount of resources available, and we can help with most types of development and projects. Um, Next up, we've got Ben Ford. Uh, I've known Ben for two, I reckon three or four years, actually. Um, and he actually gave a talk at my first ever meetup for Hasklers. Um, ben is a tech leader, Haskler, and former Royal Marine Commando. Uh, and if that's not a strong bio, uh, I'm not quite <laughs> sure what is. Um, <laughs> Ben's going to be giving you a talk on monoids, functors, and monads of terms and people. Uh, I thought I was going to trip over that uh, over that title. Did I did I write terms and people? It should have been teams and people. Oh, did I say terms? It, uh, it says teams. It is teams. Okay. Whew, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, well, oh. I'll pass across to you then, Ben. All right. Love it. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Okay. 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 First of all. Good. Right. Let's share screen. He says uh host disabled attendee screen sharing still or do i need to you're on mute pete that had to happen once during today Let of course me just, it did uh... soon <laughs> just making you host now just give me a second cool uh, here we go all right sweet Oh yeah, there's the polls. <laughs> uh, right, okay, let's go with that. Hopefully everyone can see my slides. Good, okay, so what's this talk about then? About then, about then, about then, about then, about then. Um, so as Pete mentioned, I've got a little bit of, um, and you know, my, my journey, 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 journey in programming over the last few years has been trying to figure out how we can use some of the stuff that Francis about teams, people, communication. Um, I've been in the tech industry since I left the Marines pretty much. Um, 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 and the, the journey has been very much almost like, you know, Maslow's pyramid of needs. You know, you, you learn how to be a good coder. Um, then you realize you've chosen the wrong programming language and go to functional programming. programming, programming. Uh, then you realize that you need to be able to deploy your stuff. So you go to DevOps, DevOps, DevOps. And then there's this whole layer of people and uh, teams and communication and direction and stuff underneath. And what I want is to be able to use all of the uh, cognitive tools that we are able to use in functional programming that Francis just covered um, to be able to reason about that stuff underneath. So let's see how far we get in this because it's, uh, I, I may have been a little bit optimistic about the number of slides I've put together. So let's see how we get on. So I'm using a different word for the same thing that Francis was talking about. Uh, what we want is to find abstractions. And the reason that, you know, many of us, the, one of the questions that I asked in my, my set of the polls was, um, which programming language did you come from? Like I taught myself to code Python, um, actually on board a ship with no internet, just a book. Um, and I was quite happy with Python for a while until I found functional program, program, program. <laughs> And then I found that functional programming was 
the tool that gave me better um better, 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 better ability to be able to do uh, this kind of thing um pete if anyone's asking a question that i need i need i need, I need, I need, I need to stop for just just let me know um because i can't see them I'm, I'm, I'm talking uh, I ended up using haskell um and you know like front 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 i noticed that the abstractions that we have have have, have Pete, ben, we're just, yeah we're just getting a real real problem with uh echo we might have to change you across to a different mic or something oh really okay uh okay cool i uh, cool i can do that just because at the moment it sounded yeah it sounded really glitchy it's a bit strange all right let's try the built-in mic can you hear me now? Yep. Good. I'll, I'll let you know if it, uh, if it dips out again. All right, cool. Well, I'll tell you what, then I might as well get rid of these headphones as well. Uh... Can you say something? Just so I yep. hear you. Yep. Can you hear us? Okay, I'll keep them. Right, so, yeah, so I ended up with Haskell. Um, and Haskell, obviously, is... You know, you could consider Haskell the source for some of our functional programming knowledge. Um, it's where a lot of the researchers live. It's where, the, where a lot of the abstractions um, come from, including that one category. So I'll, I'll try and dig into how we can use the abstractions that we come to in Haskell and other functional programming languages to think about teams and people. So functional programming abstractions. I mean, this is almost a carbon copy of, of what Francis said. Um, and I promise we didn't compare notes at the beginning. But uh, in my book, abstractions should be fundamental. There should be few of them. They should be small, which is kind of the same as fundamental, but not quite the same. The surface area should be small and they should be composable, which means that you know, when, you add fun when you add abstractions together, you shouldn't detract from any of them. They should be additive. Uh, out and irreducible and the right abstractions what you know Francis just did a great job of explaining what the right abstractions do for for a code base but this is what they do for our brain they allow us to to chunk knowledge together and to use bigger and bigger um, pieces of knowledge together without more overhead right so you're you're building mental representation so as an example anyone who's done any functional programming knows that the functor interface to call it it's not really the right thing to call it but the, the functor uh, abstraction can be used to reason about mapping over anything that can be mapped over so it's a very very small surface area to keep in your brain when you see that in code you know what you're looking at and you know that you're talking about a container of some sort that can be mapped so mapped over so that allows you to kind of chunk this structure up to enable you to have some intuition, which is extremely important because you're able to achieve variety, but maintain harmony by not, you know, messing your brain up with too many different things. And this is where you can take the initiative rapidly. And this is, this is where we get into the kind of my other background in the military, which is, I, which I think is important. So, what do abstractions look like when we talk about teams and people? I'm going to talk about two in particular. These are the kind of functor and monad, if you like, of, um, of, of talking about how, how we interact with our environment. So the first one is, is the OODA loop. Um, and if, if anyone, uh, well, I can't really ask the question because uh, it's not interactive, but uh, many people have heard of the OODA loop. Um, many people come across the OODA loop as a, a picture of a, of a circle with four dots on it, which is uh, pretty much the incorrect representation. That's like me saying a functor is a list. Um, so OODA is a process and it's a process to allow things that are separate from their environment, could be people, could be organizations, could be countries, um, could be uh, you know, an organism growing in an ecosystem. But things that, that take decisions uh, overcome physical obstacles and, and competitors. Um, so this evolutionary epistemology is a great uh, review 
of the OODA and, and the OODA loop and re uh, related concepts. So this is what the OODA loop is supposed to look like. This is what um, Boyd drew um, before he, uh, not long before he passed away. And, and what you have here is a, is a, a loop that contains feed forward and feedback. Um, Francis mentioned the hexagonal architecture briefly. It's not that dissimilar, uh, if I'm honest, uh, and I'll come on to what this looks like in software a little bit later. But what you have is, you know, in order to make decisions and take actions, you have to have some way of reasoning about your environment. And that's where observations and orientation comes in. So something happens, you observe it, you make a decision that you, you fit that with your worldview, you make a decision, you take an action, the action has an unfolding effect on the environment, which you then observe and then the cycle continues. But what we also have is from our orientation shapes our observation. That's the implicit guidance and control there. So you can't be a thinking being without, without making assumptions. And you know, this is what chunking was all about, right? We, we, we build abstractions so that we can make observations uh, with, with uh, you know, a more um, built out, mental tool set. And then the other implicit guidance and control is where we sometimes bite when we when we have intuition, you know, like a martial artist who's very good or something like that, you bypass decision completely because it's just automatic, it's muscle memory. And this is also something that I think is very important from, from the functional programming world is that because we have such small, neat, well-formed abstractions, we're able to build that intuition a lot more fluidly than uh, other um, styles of programming. So for example, you see a functor, you know what it is. You might take five minutes to look at a page of code in, in another language and see, oh yeah, this is the visitor pattern because it's not as well formed. So it's a, UDA is, is an improvement cycle. It's a dialectic engine for learning about your environment. So as, as you move through the environment, you go through these orientations and, and reactions, your, your orientation changes and becomes a better fit for your environment for mental models. Uh, I won't go through all of the verbiage in there because we've got a fair bit to get through. Um, I'll tell you where you can read up a little bit more about this at the end. And the building blocks of UDA. So, so Boyd was a, John Boyd was a fascinating character. He was a, a fighter pilot in the 1950s in Korea. And then he he combined the knowledge of physics. He went back to university and got a degree in physics um, to come up with this theory called energy maneuverability theory, which is still used to reason about you know, um, fighter plane performance today. And then he turned his views, uh, he, he turned his attention to military doctrine and theory. And, you know, he, he must have probably read every military book that's ever been written plus lots and lots of books about science. So the building blocks of UDA are entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, how we exchange energy and information with our environment, um, uncertainty principle, limits of observation accuracy with our environment, and Godel's incompleteness theorem, which is limits to the internal consistency and how we need to think about points of view of, of how we reason about our environment. <clears throat> I'm just gonna call out one other piece of Boyd's work, which is destruction and creation. Uh, mental models undergoing continual divergent and convergent structure cycles. Now, this is the abstraction that I'm going to dig into and make more links with uh, functional programming. Um, so what's happening here is when, when we take information from the outside world, we break it down and we mix it up with our internal representations and then we build new structure, essentially. So destruction is an increase in entropy. And then, sorry, a decrease in entropy when, when we break things up and create a bit more chaos. And then from that chaos, we create new patterns of knowledge. So the other part of the part of the OODA loop is situational awareness, right? What we're doing is reasoning about our environment. We are observing and orienting. That is essentially situational awareness. So um, it's the inward part of the OODA loop. If you think of the OODA loop as inward being awareness and outward being intention and action as we take information in from our environment and then attempt to make changes in our environment so this is the 
diagram that the US Air Force came up with, and you can see that situational awareness is essentially exactly what what we were talking about with um, the observe and orient side of the OODA loop. Uh, so we perceive, we process, we project, won't dig into this one too much. And then situational awareness for organizations. Remember, we had our task and environmental factors. We had our in individual factors. So these are, the, these are the things that we can, the levers that we can turn to improve our situational awareness and our ability to build situational awareness. And the ones that we can really, you know, as technology leaders or technologists, we can really um, tweak the best are training abilities and system design. Okay, so I, I've got a whole course on, you know, things from the military applied to tech businesses. Um, I split situational awareness up into three different timeframes, um, which is useful because, you know, if you're using quite vague language to talk about concrete features that need to be delivered quickly, uh, you're you're probably talking at the wrong level of detail. And likewise, if you're trying to break down a long-term six month plan into very fine detail, you're probably wasting energy trying to be too specific when things will change. Uh, and then it's also useful to separate two, two perspectives. So external, what's going on outside our environment and internal, what's going on in, inside our environment. So, you know, from the point of view of a single programmer, external might be, you know, what's on my uh, roadmap and internal might be what states my code in, right? How how am I set up to be able to, de to deliver? Um, and so we get into a little bit of recursion already. So external situation awareness for a sub team is the internal situation awareness of a larger formation. So, you know, that external situation awareness of a, a programmer looking at their, uh, their roadmap is internal situation awareness potentially for, you know, the product team or, you know, whoever's doing business strategy, things like that. So another one that isn't really related to the military is team topologies. Um, so this is a fantastic book. There's been some great, um, quite rigorously backed research on performance in software development that is relevant across whichever paradigm you happen to use. So Accelerate is one. Uh, which is a very good book and team topologies is another one of my favorite books lately. So it uses the idea of Conway's law, cognitive load and building responsive, reactive organizations. Um, and it's, and it, it builds a very nice little abstraction actually. So what you have is you have four fundamental team, team topologies or team types. So the streamlined team is what you might call your cross-functional team. Enabling team is like a coaching or, um, uh, you know, leadership teams would be something like that. Complicated subsystem team is your rocket scientist beavering away at some specific, you know, video codec or something that's very, very niche. And then your platform team is what emerges when you need to make all of those things more efficient. And the four topologies are mediated by three different interaction models. So you've got the flow of change flows along, the flow of change from the outside world flows along um, streamlined teams, which are the long yellow ones. They are often helped with facilitation by these supportive teams. And then you might have these teams talking to each other in the API and the platform team with uh, X as a service. So this would be, you know, to Francis's example of hexagonal architecture, the dashed lines in these squares are the, the X as a service and the, the one that crosses the three stream aligned teams, that would be the external part of your hexagonal architecture. And then you've got this other, um, this other interaction pattern, which is direct collaboration. So, you know, just as we would use monads, functors, monoids, the, the kind of abstractions that we like, this is a way of using a similar tool set, similar size tool set to try and reason about how teams communicate and work together. So that brings us to our first little bit of code here. So I'm gonna make the argument that pretty much anything you care about in functional programming can be thought of as folds and unfolds. 
uh, including the stuff that Francis talked about before, right? So Francis was giving an example in, in, in Haskell, you might do this with a, with a free monad. Um, and what Francis was doing to, to interpret that program was folding over it. He was, he was destroying the structure to produce, to produce an output. So again, going back to some of Boyd's work, he wrote this paper in 1976. Um, it's like seven pages long. It's an amazing piece of work that really synthesizes or summarizes all of all of the things that he'd synthesized about the learning process. And we can see that in, in this fold signature, right? We've, we, we've got events that happen. We've got the current state of the world. We smash the state and the event together with a function that produces a new state. We apply that to a source of events, which could be a stream, a list, a web socket, whatever, but it's a functor. And at the end of that fold, so fold L is something that you would run on a static, but there is a version of fold L, which is called scan L, which is every event that you have produces the state. So you, you're basically transforming one event stream into another event stream. And then we get into like the really kind of crazy, um, crazy world of recursion schemes. I'm not gonna, uh, my brain is probably rusty enough that I haven't used this in anger for quite some time, but, uh, the, the generalized version of folding is called a catamorphism. Uh, so in a lot of the things that, that John DeGose talks about in, in, um, in Scala world, you have this thing called a free monad, which is that fix F thing there. Uh, and this is the, the type signature of the interpret function that Francis had pretty much. The F A is a functor that contain that carries some kind of, um, side effect. So the FA would be this, the structure of the, um, uh, it would be the structure of your, uh, your, um, what's the word? The structure of the data type that you're going to interpret the recursive data type, data type. And then anamorphism is the opposite of that. It's you take a seed and from that you produce one of these structures. Um, and then when we talk about interacting with the environment, we have either a hylomorphism, which is um, an, an unfold followed by a fold. This is the one you, you see this quite often in like analytic systems and things like that. Uh, MapReduce is, is a form of this. There's a nice little closure library called Transducers, which is something very similar to this. Um, and then the other version of this, which isn't in, in as common use, but essentially model stream processing is called a metamorphism, which just has the kata and the ana switched around. But when you dive into recursion schemes and, and get a bit more into folds, you know, folding and unfolding is quite equivalent in some kind of weird brain bending way. So what does this look like in, in a software pattern? Francis mentioned the, um, the hexagonal architecture before. Well, you can model event sourcing as a hexagonal architecture quite happily. You, you have your logic in the middle, you feed it a stream of events um, and commands from the outside world. So the commands are the things that you want to change. You have your function, which is a fold. Essentially, it takes your state and the new events and it creates a new state. And then from that, you have, you know, the ELM architecture and Halogen. Halogen is a pure script library. There was somebody asking about pure script earlier. The Halogen actually is modeled as a function, as a um, free monad underneath. And what you have is events or commands that happen by people clicking things in the HTML or by web sockets or whatever else that all gets merged into a big event type. And then you fold over that event type to make your state. And then out of band, your state is rendered into the representation of your UI. And, you know, it's folds all the way down when you, when you really dig into functional programming and, and the literature, uh, F algebras are, those catamorphism things, free monads are as well. Interpreters have already covered. Um, recursion schemes, there's lots and lots of these different types of morphisms. There's um, paramorphisms where you have access to, to the, um, the, the results that have gone before for calculating new results. There's semi-groups and monoids, which are, um, uh, monoids are a mathematical structure that enables you to, to fold over structures. I didn't really do that justice, but 
functional composition, uh, there's a monoid called the endo, which allows you to use exactly the same reasoning for function composition. So your dot is your monoidal addition. And then there's fold L in Haskell land, which is a package that does these left folds. Uh, so Q and A further reading. Um, I think I may have rushed through this because I, I know it's, it's quite dense material and I wanted to make sure that I left enough time for kind of discussion or um, questions. Uh, so recursion schemes is, is good to look into. There's a whole list of um, resources there. And then there's these books, which when, when you really get down to it, I don't know if anyone's read any of these, maybe we could discuss that afterwards, but um, you know, the art of learning, team of teams, destruction and creation. My belief is that they, they can all be modeled quite elegantly with the kinds of thinking tools, you know, applying, applying the, the software architecture principles that Francis went through to building a more general mental toolbox for reasoning about how we interact with our environment and the world and each other in our software teams. That's it. Uh, and I will now jump out of this and have a look at the questions. Okay. Okay, any questions, q and I can't see any questions, so it looks like, looks like we're all good. Yeah, nothing on there at the moment. Uh, cool. Does anyone have, anyone have anything or? I realize I probably, I probably um, ran over that fairly quickly. It's, um, and I probably applied a little bit too much chunking for the process of explaining it as well. <laughs> is, there, is there anything else you wanted to go into, Ben, before we? Uh... Okay. Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, it, it, it it's, um, <laughs> yeah, very good, Lawrence. Hold on. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this, this, I, I wasn't sure how the, the format of this would work, to be honest, because I think this, this kind of application of these tools is, is better done as a kind of a dialogue almost. Um, it's quite difficult to, chunk it all up into a set of slides. So if anyone wants to, you know, chat with me or pick holes in what I've said or, you know, ask questions, then probably hit me up on Twitter or, or uh, via email. I'm, I'm at Commando Dev on Twitter. Yeah, I think, I think to follow on from what Ben's saying there, um, the, for, the format of this can be changeable um, as, we, as we go forward. The first attempt, I thought, use a webinar software, give it a go, see how it works. Uh, a little bit of a problem with uh, with YouTube and being able to post live, um, and just getting used to it. Really, um, I, was, I was hoping they'd give me a little demo on it, but they they didn't get back to me in time. So maybe next one's going to be using Hop in or or something else. Um, it's all about making do until we can have in person meetups again. Uh, obviously, we'll keep them keep them filmed so people who aren't potentially based in London or even based in the UK can still visit, can still listen and uh, still still get be a part of it. Um, but yeah, for now, it's just a case of, of waiting a little bit. Um, for people like Lawrence, who, uh, who just made it in for the final part of the last talk, uh, I had to call him out a little bit. Um, the, uh, the talk will be available on YouTube. Um, so I'll share that uh, across my social channels tomorrow. Um, I'll grab my slide uh, link as well. They're open. Uh, they. Uh, there's also a question there from from Harry, um, which I don't know, I don't know who it's uh, who's across to. So I'll, I'll leave you both to answer that. Can you see that on the chat? Uh, Harry. Um, oh, I see. Okay, so um, Accelerate is a book about DevOps. Um, and The Art of Learning is a book by Josh Waitskin, who is a child chess prodigy turned martial artist turned big wave surfer. He's done a couple of mind-blowing interviews with Tim Ferriss on his podcast. Um, the concepts in The Art of Learning are very, very general, very applicable. It's one of the best books I've ever read, so 
depends. If you want something specific to software, then go for Accelerate. Um, if you're looking for something that's like, how do you build better software teams, go for Accelerate. If you're looking for uh, a mind expanding experience, go for uh, the art of learning. Brilliant. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for, for coming along today. Um, it's the first one. Uh, like I said, the format's going to change a little bit. Um, but I, I really appreciate everyone for, for stopping by. Um, and especially thank you very much, Ben, for, for your um, for your talk. And Francis, thank you very much for, for being the first. Uh, it's never easy. Um, well, it was a pleasure. <laughs> oh, we've got uh, an unanswered question in the Q&A from James. Oh, excellent. How much experience does one have to have in the functional paradigm to get started in a job? Um, so my, Pete, this might be one for you actually, but my experience in the Haskell world is that there's still an oversupply of candidates. Um, so people tend to become quite experienced on like open source things or, or just upskilling themselves. Um, there's not a huge amount compared to some other um, communities. Is uh, I feel like there's not a huge amount of junior level development positions available, but that might be different for, for let's say Scala or, or Closure. What do you think, Pete? As a, uh, as a I, I would agree. Sorry, Francis, go on first. Uh, so it, it really depends. So personally, so I had to happen to me to hire people and actually my position is that more than functional programming, uh, I expect people to be to uh, to know actually like the principles that I that I talked about. Uh, I think that if you you don't necessarily need to know all the patterns in functional programming to actually do functional programming, if you if you follow those simple principles, think about local reasoning and 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 some um, basically way like a if you manage to have this 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 state like this this mental mental model um, to like to whatever you program like that that's already a lot that's probably more than a vast majority of developers in my opinion so even if you have one two years three years of experience you know, like in, and you know that then for me it's you're good to go you can we can work together you can learn i can like basically we can we can learn we can look at different patterns like monoids monads applicatives and some other to, some other stuff that that ben actually mentioned but uh, I think that that step is already a big one. <laughs> so, I would just like to add, add actually, sorry, before I, I think it's better always to build teams that are a mix of experiences if you can. It's just that the way it seems to work out in the way that the, the Haskell community is set up is that you know there are few enough people looking for Haskellers uh, and enough Haskellers that generally it seems to be a bit top heavy with senior senior level folks i would say pete would you say that's accurate yeah completely uh it's definitely is dependent on language um for some it is easier um an example of that would be getting into something like closure has got such strong links with object-oriented ruby that from what i've seen in my experience it tends to be a bit easier to make that switch across there's companies that have that have that mixed stack of Clojure and Ruby as well. So you can leverage using working with object oriented language across to move working in Clojure. Um, Scala also has that a little bit with Java. Um, and there are people who use Java already in a very functional way. So they're already on that step across. Um, as Ben mentioned, Haskell is tougher. Um, I think that's a little bit because of the community. Um, there is very few companies using Haskell commercially until recently. It is growing. There are little startups that have, have really blossomed. One of them was a company in, Habito, uh, in London called Habito. Um, they started a few years ago and now have a team that's one of the largest in, in the UK with about 40 Haskell engineers working full time. Um, so it and is pure script as well, right? Say again? And pure script as well for Habito. Yeah, pure script, yes. Um, on the more front end side of things. But yeah, so I think it is changing. Um, the best advice I can give is if you do want to make that switch, make sure you've got some evidence of some functional programming available on a portfolio or um, available on some, just some, 
some Haskell repos or whichever language you're choosing to go to on your GitHub. Just make that strong case so you can get that first interview and really show off your skills that you've learned in your spare time. Um, once you're in the door, um, past that is then up to you on the interview stage. But it's just getting that first that first bit of interest from a company is all about just having that as much evidence as possible that you are really interested in working in a functional language. Um, and from there, yeah. And like I said, if you need any more advice on that, just hit me up uh, and I'll try my best to help you. Brilliant. Was there anything there? Is, yeah, just just one one comment uh, is that I think that Haskell is, is actually a perfect language if you really want to learn functional programming simply because it's like going to a country where they speak the language you wanna you wanna learn. You don't have to cho the choice to to use another one. When you go to Scala, for example, you can still uh, like work your way out uh, coding in a Java-ish way. What I what I really suggest is is um, yeah, learn Haskell definitely if you want to to get to get serious about functional programming. But maybe a, a, like a, a first step is is to do functional programming with the with the language you already know as much as possible. You may not be able to do everything that you can you can learn like that that you have in functional programming, but you can do a lot with simple functions. So learn to, to code with functions, and then later on you can you can learn more about the patterns and maybe move to another language if you're really really interested by that. Yeah, definitely. Um, there was one more question for for you, chap. I think, which is more about uh, people teaching themselves to code, um, like like staying on track. Um, I don't know who, who who'd like to answer that. I'll go for that one. Although I'm probably a terrible person to ask. Um, so Lu Lucy, I. Um, I got so enamored with um, Haskell that I used to get up at five o'clock in the morning to to every day before work to to try and teach myself a little bit more. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that because it's dark now at <laughs> five o'clock. Um, what I would say is it's good, like one of the mistakes that I made, which I think is also a little bit of a flavor of Haskell is I read way too many papers and books and theory. Like I read, you know, Erlang books and I read F sharp books what I really should have done was start cut, started coding before I was ready. Um, and, you know, code is a way better teacher than reading in my view. Um, especially in Haskell land where there's just so much dense computer science. Um, you know, it's really, really fun reading it, but it doesn't teach you to code as quick as you could, if you just sort of started throwing, throwing some, throwing some code around. That's my advice. I think. Francis, have you got anything to add to, anything to, add to that? It's it's uh, yeah. I think you need both. Really, you need uh, you need to practice. Yeah, you know, actually, practice a lot as much as you can. Uh, I remember that uh, when I first um, uh, started doing functional programming. So I didn't exactly know what to do. I, I was already doing some Scala, uh, but what helped me a lot is is to re-implement the concept that I've heard here and there just to, to see actually the problems that I'm dealing with to understand them. And then later on, while reading, I discovered, oh, actually that's, that's how you do it. That's the solution, I get it. But it was, it was easy to understand simply because I already know, knew about the problem. So, and if you start coding, um, I believe that actually functional programming is probably easier to think about. Um, so many people learn to code with, uh, with all variables and side effects all the way, but I think I think they confuse themselves more than anything else. So if you're really new to, to coding, uh, like dealing with functions is probably like uh, coding with functions in, in a functional way is probably um, easier, like it's more mathematical, it's more logical compared to, to what you know already. Like you probably know already a little bit of math, a little bit of logic. So so that's that's gonna help you a lot. Right, brilliant. I think if we've got no more questions, that's uh, that's us done for today. And people can can switch channels and go across to John Degas' his, uh, <laughs> his talk. I think we've already lost a few, haven't we? Yeah, exactly. There's a few, few that have already head over there. Uh, like I said, thanks again for everyone for turning up. Uh, I'm going to share the polls that I did create um, that I spent all afternoon making. Um, I'll share them directly with attendees. I think I could do it via email. Uh, but yeah, thanks very much for everyone. Uh, 
thanks for coming and we'll speak, see you maybe towards the end of uh, November. Thanks, everyone. Brilliant. Thanks, Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye. See you. Bye-bye.